moving from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Meehan, alongside my partner, the professor, Luigi Rosa Bianca. What's going on today, Lou? What do we got on tap? Matt, you know, one of the things that ails us most is poor small business owners in America have to wear so many different hats. And, and one hat we often neglect is how do you price your product or service? Fret not small business owners. We have your savior. Pierre, the price whisperer chauffeurs, is here to explain to us not just how to price your product or service, but why. So big round of applause for Pierre via Sweden, but now a native of California. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Chauffeurs. Thank you so much, Luigi, and thank you so much, Matthew. And um, I'm excited about this. I hope it's going to be great for the audience. Some good advice and maybe some entertaining stuff as well. Well, Pierre, straight from the get-go, what makes us curious is when you're pricing a product or service, is it specific to the product or service that is being sold by the merchant or small business owner? Or is there a little bit of positioning of the brand that helps you achieve a certain status? Oh, absolutely. Um, there, there is something out there called pricing power. And pricing power was, um, is, is a term that was uh, coined by Warren Buffett. And he said that the most important criterion for whether you want to invest in a company is whether it has pricing power or not. And, and then he continued to, um, um, to uh, explain what he, what he means with that. And he said, pricing power is the ability to increase prices without losing sales volume. So... What, what that means is that pricing power is something that a company earns. You know, you don't have it from the get-go. And you earn pricing power by focusing on the um, customer segment that is more likely to be willing to pay higher prices. You position yourselves in meaningful ways to that audience. You... Um, um, you you um, uh, you have product or services that are differentiated in again meaningful way, ways to that audience, and by doing all of this, you earn the right to charge higher prices and see often even a higher sales volume at the same time. Now, Pierre, how much of this is is educational to the ultimate consumer, and how much of this is a little bit of the uh, the corner shell game, right? If I'm buying, let's say, a breakfast cereal and it's dry corn with a lot of sugar in a bland box, yep. then I can buy dry corn with even more sugar on a really fun, colorful box, maybe with an athlete on it. Yep. Why am I paying more for that? Um, because you've been exposed to a lot of advertising. And um, there, is a, there is actually an academic field behind all, all that we do in my company. And, and we are leaning on to the work of three Nobel Prize winners. And these are folks that won the Nobel Prize prizes for their, um, their work in behavioral economics. And behavioral economics is all about understanding how we as humans make um, buying decisions. And in, in terms of our buying decisions, they are influenced by a lot of things. And that, that is called the decision landscape. And the decision landscape says that um, we both have internal uh, references because every buying decision is, is made through with references. We have internal references called heuristics. And then we have all the external references. And one of the reasons that you pay more for that uh, breakfast cereal in a colorful book uh, box is that you've been, um, you've been exposed to a lot of advertising. So the brand is familiar. And a brand, if you think about it, is a promise of 
consistency and a certain quality and a certain benefit. That's what a brand is. When we make our purchase decision, our fear of, of making the wrong purchase decision has been proven to be 2.25 times more powerful in making uh, or not making our purchase decision compared to making it, compared to the benefit of making it. So the familiarity of that colorful book box versus um, the non-familiarity of a, a non-branded product um, that, uh, that doesn't have that promise of, um, of, of, um, of, of benefits and, and quality means that I'm more likely to buy the product that is less risky, right? And I'm willing to pay more money for that. Now, how much of that is true empirical value and how much of that is psychological? Like I'm going to use myself as an example, and it, it's almost uh, achieved hysterical status in my family that I will only drive a German car. I've been driving German cars for 30 years, but I've also never gone to a mechanic in 30 years. Every morning mm -hmm. it starts, and I live in the Northeast, so you can imagine the fluctuation in temperature. Mm -hmm. Now, is my decision biased because... Germans, whether it's BMW, Mercedes, Audi, et cetera, et cetera, have a certain quality? Or have I been sold a bill of goods just because they have really cool commercials? Uh, I think it's a combination of both. But I mean, uh, I'm, 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 I'm peculiar in the same way. I mean, uh, all my watches have three words on it that is, is, um, is consistent. <laughs> it's, uh, they all say automatic, right? And they all say Swiss made. Right, <laughs> and and they don't they're not better than 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 um, uh, than some some cheap Chinese shit in actually telling me the time, right? But um, it it's I want to be associated with with that kind of quality message that that uh, that those watchmakers delivers to me. Maybe not other people, but to me it delivers a. It gives me, um, it gives me a, a certain um, uh, comfort in that I have the uh, that I bought the right kind of product. Is a word to be used, perhaps status? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, cars is a little different because, in a way, I'm with you. I've never had an American car. Um, uh, I've had this, you know, yeah, the same worry, the no same brand the same brands as you have. No one else also, in the country ever has either. I don't think we make any American cars anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They're all made in. Even Mercedes's are made in 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 Mexico. You know, the the uh, I've never I never had that, but but I did have a um, I've had a couple of Japanese uh, Lexuses. You know, made in Japan, not made here in the U.S. Hey Pierre, can you bring us back? Tell us where the price obsession and prices began for you. Where'd you start? <laughs> yeah, where I started. I ran companies, um, and I I established and ran a company out of Zurich in Switzerland. Um, I took over. Um, the the um, uh, European subsidiary of a Japanese electronics firm yeah, out of London, and um, I um, came here to the States to uh, establish and run a division of a fairly large public company, and then I had another four CEO positions, and and we did experiments in pricing in in, in all of these instances, and some of those experiments were very very successful, meaning that. Um, um, next quarter revenues were up 25% or so, and some were complete duds. And uh, what I had learned in business school and I could read about pricing was so academic and so theoretical that um, it didn't help us in any way to, uh, to, to understand why some of those experiments worked and others didn't. So 15 years ago, I decided I was too old and too opinionated to be a hired gun anymore. So I set up my own shop and I developed a process that makes every pricing experiment a success. You know, we like to get down to brass tacks here when we're dealing with small business owners mm -hmm. and we're dealing with people that have been in business for a while. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you two scenarios. Let's start with the first one. Let's say you're a startup and you're starting out your company, right? And you're not sure what price point you should be in. Mm -hmm usually most people try to undercut the competition, right? Mm -hmm. I don't generally agree in that. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts and where should you be able to price your product and how can you find some information on that? Well, um, there's two things to, to consider in, in that scenario. First off, if you're starting a company 
um, and you bring to the market something that is unique, something that is destructive in the market, you are only going to sell to early adopters, right? And early adopters buy for all different reasons, but low price is not one of them, right? So, <clears throat> if but it has to be something that is is disruptive in some way, um, and one of the most common mistakes that startups do is just what you said. They come up with something new. They come up with something disruptive. And, and they try to look at competition, which often is very difficult, to be honest, um, and, and, and then price lower. And because, they, they, uh, because there's only few early adopters, you know, a year goes by and they look at the bank balance and they look at what they promised investors and there's a huge gap, right? And, and, and then they panic, and then they lower their prices. The, the only result that sales volume may even get lower because price is the most important message of, of, of value and quality. And if you lower your price, people say, this is not good enough. I'm not going to buy it. So, and, 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 and then they can't raise the price again. So they die, Right. So if, you, if you're a startup, <clears throat> you go to market with a disruptive product, you have to, par you have to price high. I, I, I read this um, um, article about Mark Andreas and, you know, famed the VC guy. Um, and, and he was asked uh, by, by somebody a couple of years ago, what is the single most important message to give or advice to give to startups? And his answer was very succinct. He said, in increase your prices, right? Because that's also when you need the money the most, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so, so that's one thing. But there is a trick here, right? And I mentioned this that that um, price sets an expectation of quality. It's something called expectation bias, and we've all been in the situation where we hold something in our hands, literally or figuratively. And we kind of we think that I kind of want to buy this, but the price is so low that I think it's not going to be good enough, right? And then we don't buy, right? Um, so expectation bias is important. And if you're a startup, you can do this: you can go and find at least twenty-five potential customers. These are not your current customers; they are not your current um, prospects. They are absolutely not friends and family, but 25 individuals, if, you, if you're, if you're in, in B2C or, or companies, if you're in B2B, and you ask, you, you describe your product or your service and the benefits, and then you ask them two questions. The first question is, and phraseology here is very important. So the first question is, now that you know what this product or service is and the benefits that it provides, what would be a price that is just a little too low? So you think that we will overpromise and underdeliver. And then you'd say the next question, consider the flip side. We are going to over um, underpromise and overdeliver. What is still a price that's just a little too high? So it doesn't matter how good it is you still won't buy it. When you have those 25 data points for too low and 25 data points for too high, you average those two points and you have the range of where your prices should be. Not below that and not over that. And then you send, set your price towards the high end because that's going to be more profitable. This is something, and if you don't, if you can't find those 25 people, you have bigger problems than pricing. <laughs> I really like that strategy because you're outgoing, you do, you're doing a market survey before you even get started because this way you don't really have to raise your prices out of the gates, but you don't have to lower them either, right? So now let's say you're in business, you've been in business for a while. And one thing that we come across and we talk to our clients with is about raising their prices. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are afraid to raise yep. their prices. Why do you think that is and how can they overcome that? Anybody in the sales or most people in sales, at least, are aware of the term buyer liar, right? And um, 
<clears throat> and obviously what this means is that when you try to sell something to to anybody the, the the that anybody will always tell you or indicate that your product or service is not as good as competition and is more expensive therefore you have to lower your prices and 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 eventually when you hear this for the 250th time you start believing it right <laughs> and 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 you believe that um, because, um, and 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 that that means that almost all companies that we work with are timid in pricing. That's one thing that to to so they underprice their product or service. The other thing is that very few realize the the the, the relationship between prices, sales volume, and revenue. I'll give you an example: it is a prior customer. Fairly small company, um, I think about nine or ten million dollars. So they're not a startup; they've been around for a while. The owner sent me uh, an unsolicited email a couple of maybe two months ago, and it was a um, it was a screenshot from his accounting system. And what I could see from that screenshot was that his sales volume were down a few percent, maybe five percent, but his margin were up forty nine percent, right? And his message was very short. It says Less work, more money, many things. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love that. Yeah. There, but there's another thing, which is also, and this is a startup. This was a, um, a SaaS company um, we worked with. And, and, and because price also selects your customers. And price-sensitive customers are not customers you typically want, right? Um, so this particular company, uh, again, a SaaS company, um, they were so underpriced that we could say that they could quadruple their prices. They didn't do it overnight, but over about a nine-month period, they inched up the prices. And, and then as I followed up with the CEO, um, he said two things happened. First off, at four times the prices, um, our sales volume went up with 25%. Um, and secondly, he said, and I'm paraphrasing the term he used, um, he said, we got rid of the bottom feeders. So now our customer support costs have gone down with 80%. And that's because those price sensitive customers, they they buy whatever they they buy from, from the company because of low prices. And they're not really interested or vested in the product or service. So they don't take the the they don't take the effort to learn how to use it properly, to, to get the benefits, right? So they clog up your customer support line. And you invest as a company a lot of money educating these folks and um, supporting them and so forth. And, and as soon as there is a, uh, uh, an alternative that is one cent cheaper, they're gone. Absolutely. So usually when you see these SaaS companies and you go, because I sign up for a lot of softwares that we use over here, right? They usually give you three pricing structures to choose. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. always, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I never want to go to the cheapest one. I usually go yeah. to the one that's a little bit more money because it has a little bit more bells and whistles out there. Is that, is that a marketing scheme? Is that, a, is that an actual strategy? That you well, uh, it goes back on? to the, 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 um, how we make decisions. And I'm, I'm going to stay with this for a little while, actually, because this is very important. If you present your, your client with a single price, the client has a option of buying or not buying. When you present your client with three prices, a good, better, best, the client has a, has a choice of buying one of the three or none, right? So you, instead of having an, a, a sort of digital uh, choice of buy or not buy, suddenly there are options, right? And, and almost always people select the middle option. Now, the way you present your price is enormously powerful. And it's something called price anchoring. And what this means is that as we, we as humans, uh, and I talked about the, the, the decision landscape, we as humans cannot not compare numbers. We are being presented with two or more numbers. We are comparing them. We just do. What this means is that you want to have not a good, better, best. You want to have a best, good, best, better, good, right? As we read left to right, top to bottom, we want to make sure that you present the high price first 
because that will make the other two prices appear more affordable. And I'll tell you the, the most brilliant way of using price anchoring I have seen was done when Apple came out with a watch, the Apple Watch, because they had um, the regular model was $349, right? But they had a version with exactly the same electronics in a golden case for $17,000. Every journalist that wrote about this product launch talked about the audacity of Apple to have sell the same electronics for 349 and 17,000. But of course, as, as those interested in this watch were reading all these, um, all these articles, it was 17,000 versus 349, 17,000 versus 349. And that 349 became more and more and more and more affordable. I tell Matt all the time, charging our podcast guests $15,000 per episode is very reasonable. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to lower it, not after this episode. <laughs> yeah, let, let, me ask you, let me ask you a positioning strategy that we all see. There is a company called Costco. You may have heard of them. Oh, yeah. They're a low ticket, high volume business. Mm -hmm. But they also have their... Uh, their proprietary brand, Kirkland. Yep. But if you look at Kirkland over the last couple of years, they've also upped the ante and, and they're trying to become a little bit more uh, of a quality brand. Like mm -hmm. what's the pricing strategy there? Are they a discount store with a premium brand or is their proprietary brand so good at also bargain basement prices? Like I mentioned before we actually started the recording here, I'm on my fourth mug of coffee, right? Um, I used to buy Starbucks French roast. You know, I have my own grinder and stuff like that until I found that, um, and I bought it at, at, at Costco, right? Um, until I found that uh, the Kirkland brand French roast is a branded Starbucks French roast. So it's exactly the same coffee. It tastes exactly the same, right? And, and it's about 25% cheaper, right? Now, Costco has actually repositioned themselves. They used to be positioned as you buy in bulk and therefore we are cheap. But they have repositioned themselves into you buy in bulk and we provide best value for money, which is not the same as cheap. But there, there, is, a, there is a sort of rule of thumb. It, this is obviously uh, different for different um, uh, products, but rule of thumb in, in retail is that the store brand should not be more than 15% cheaper than the well-known brand, right? More, if it's cheaper than 15%, they will, you know, the store brand will not sell as well as, as the, um, as the, as the brand it's compared to, right? For that same thing, the expectation bias, which is something that, um, the same thing with discounts. Um, if you discount more than 20%, it become a message of the vendor just want to get rid of this. So I won't buy it, right? So uh, and what this means is that you will, in most cases, a, a discount less than 10% is not effective in driving additional sales. A discount more than 20% leaves money on the table. You will not have a higher sales volume at a 30% discount. At a at a forty percent discount compared to what you have at twenty percent. Pierre, so walk us through the analysis of some of these luxury brands when they sell their products at these um, outlets. I mean, you will have, and most of us that live in near metropolitan areas have outlets near us. Yeah. If there are certain brands that will not even participate in the outlet game. Walk us through the pros and cons of that strategy. Well, uh, unbeknownst to most buyers at these um, at these outlets, what they sell at the outlet is not the same stuff as at the, they're selling at the, um, at the at the at the at the true branded stores. They have different collections and collections that they um, presumably um, are lower in manufacturing costs and so forth and doesn't have the, 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 the same potential quality as what they're selling in, in, their, uh, in, in their true branded stores. So what they do is that they, they leverage the, the, the strength of their brand name to drive 
and that's why they call an outlet. You know, uh, it's not a um, call it. A, I mean, we talked about we talked about um, um, coffee here, right? Uh, there's something called fri- fighting brands. Fighting brands is something you do for to to reach um, reach a um, a community of of um, uh, maybe a bit more price sensitive customers. So <clears throat> Starbucks have a fighting brand called Se- Seattle's Best. Same coffee, a lot cheaper, you know? And so by having a fighting brand, and these stores uh, could be considered fighting brands, these uh, outlet stores, um, you expand your potential market reach. So you have the people who buy because you're a brand, and you have the people who buy because um, they, they, they are appealed by the lower prices and so forth. So that's essentially the same thing as like Lexus and Toyota. Right? Yeah, Ex- so well, had- except that was the that was sort of the flip side in that you know Toyota yeah. created Lexus. Can I tell you a story about that? That's, Please, that's sort of, yeah, um, the the uh, there's a small community of of um, of uh, sort of people who do pricing very different than I do in my company and 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 in my the, my kind of advice, but. One of these uh, consultants um, used the introduction of, of Lexus as a as a um, example of um, of how you can use pricing strategy to to become successful. And and in his teaching and in his books and stuff like that, he said that the reason for Toyota's success with Lexus was that it came the LS four hundred at the time came in at a price that was two-thirds of a Mercedes S-Class, right? And, and then his theory is that you come in with a low price, which is exactly opposite what I say, right? And then you raise the price. Uh, and he called is that you go in with a penetration price to grab market share, and then you increase your price to a skimming price to make profits, right? Whatever we are, you know, 40 years after this introduction of the LS, um, um, LS 400, the uh, I think it's called the LS 550 nowadays or something like that. Um, it is still two thirds of the price of a Mercedes S class, right? <laughs> so the whole idea of then raising the price uh, to 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 skim to um, to 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 increase your profits just doesn't work. You know, you have to go out high, set a reference, right? Accept um, that 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 um, because price sets that expectation of quality, right? And uh, and you can re- you can raise prices, but there's a process for it, and it's not always successful. Pierre, let us ask you a personal question: If you had the choice to invest in a gas station, and there was four gas stations at an intersection, mm-hmm. and one was a high ticket like a Mobile or Exxon. Another one was a Citgo, then maybe a Gasseteria and a, and a white label brand. Which uh-huh. one would you, as a savvy, price conscious entrepreneur, invest in? Um, I would invest in a gas station that is not on a corner with three other gas stations. <laughs> and, and let me tell you another story. <laughs> Um, let me tell you another story. But isn't it, competition good? Uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> on 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 the 15 freeway between Los Angeles and 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 Vegas, there's a fairly long stretch in the in in the uh, in the um, uh, in the desert. Fairly long. I don't know how how far it is. It may be 50 miles or something like that, with only a single gas station. And <clears throat> I had to stop there to actually. I was I had a passenger and and she needed to have a, a bio break right and um, so we stopped at that gas station and lo and behold I saw that their prices were twice that of what you expect to pay right <laughs> and obviously very few people fill up right uh, but the few who does is extraordinarily uh, profitable for for that gas station right. And at the time we were talking about, at, uh, at the time, color, uh, gas, and this was uh, last time there was a price hike on gas. Um, the the um, We were paying like 
four bucks a gallon or or something like that. And at this gas station, it was eight fifty. Right. Wow. That's like <laughs> it's like when you're going to return the rental car to the airport. <laughs> it's yes. always double the price right there because they yeah. know they, you have no other choice. They got yeah, you. correct, correct. They and that's why right I, that's why I, car prices and right above everybody else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> profits are good, but you have to deliver something for the profits. Obviously, right. One one of one of the the things that we teach companies is to put pricing as a centerpiece in their business strategy, right? Because when you do, a lot of very small decisions are going to be very different, right? And because of that, um, we, have, we have many, many clients who followed our advice, not only with pricing, but be positioning and marketing and all of that stuff that leads to higher profits at the end, profits that they reinvest in the, in the company to develop more products, to market more, to develop their market, marketing more, to, um, to even to hire the better people, right? And because of that, when you start looking at pricing as the centerpiece or a centerpiece in your whole business strategy, it elevates the company to the next level. And, and, and I have many, many customers who over a couple of years um, or a few years, I should say, have um, 5x their company in, in, in revenue, 10x their company in revenue. Peter, isn't that part of the American pharmaceutical industry pricing strategy where so much has to be put into R&D and future prospects that when they do have a hit, they've got to ride that horse for as long as possible? Yeah, I, I think in, in I think I, I mean the statistics is 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 terrible. I think there's one or one and a half percent of all medications that they start working on and developing are actually being approved for use. But but having said that, there also there also need to be a some kind of of you should not uh, price gouge people people that's the wrong thing to do um and was what was his name shikel something like that he he bought yeah. this company and 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 um and uh, increased price with 1100% for for something that um for some drug that that the um um the insurance companies wouldn't reimburse people for and and that kept them alive yeah, that, that, that was one of the, the probably the most extreme examples of price yes. gouging that was out there. I don't know. There, there is, um, you know, I'm an old fart, so I take a lot of medications, but, but I'm, not, I'm not paying any, any particularly high price for anything, even for the, for the branded stuff, because my, um, my insurance covers most of it, you know? Well, I, I think that's part of another game, though, too, and I don't want to dive too deep into that, where the insurance companies only pay out half of what their bill. It's it's, it's all a game of back. Yeah, that's that's what they can negotiate with. But Pierre, we really appreciate you being here. We won't want to take up too much of your time, but can you tell everybody how they can get in touch with you? Can give them the website sure. for your company, and I I know you're on LinkedIn because I'm sure a lot of the audience is going to have questions because a lot of them are going to market with new. Companies. Yeah, the the you know the best way of finding me is just do a Google search for the Price Whisper. I have a I have a new book out called The Price Whisper uh, with a subtitle. Um, a holistic approach to pricing power. And in that book, I, I tell companies any everything they need to know about how to use pricing to elevate themselves to the next level, double their size, to triple their size, to um, quadruple their, their um, shareholder value and stuff like that. And um, you also find uh, my company um, through that. And um, and um, you can also go to showforce.com, my, so my last name.com, or uh, thepricewhisper.me. That also leads to, to my company. So um, there are many ways. And yes, I am on LinkedIn. And um, since I'm business to business, I, but I'm thinking about maybe setting up a TikTok channel as well. So. I think you'd be good on that. Yeah. <laughs> I can see you doing the dance moves. <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> you know pierre we really appreciate you being here like i said i do have one question for you before i let you yeah, run flip it okay. so all these software and technology companies they come up with these freemium models at first mm -hmm. do you agree with the freemium model or are you yeah, 100 
you do. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And and um, remember that I said that the the um, based on 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 behavioral economics, we know that the fear of making uh, the, the wrong buying decision is 2.25 uh, times more powerful than than the expected benefit. So to be able to try a software first and make sure that it, it actually do what what you expect it to do for you um, uh, mitigates almost all of that fear. So it's absolutely a good way of doing it, right? So I have a two-part question now. <laughs> I'm going to change this up. So people get involved in the software. They go online. They sign up. But not all the options are open to them at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think you should unlock everything? Yeah, you should you unlock should... everything. But but it needs to be done. It really depends a little bit on on the complexity of the software. And if it is if it is complex software, you you want to unlock the features and functions that a novice can use, right? Um, if you unlock all maybe all features that only an expert can use, and then it's going to confuse a lot of people. And, and obviously, a confused potential buyer is not going to be a true buyer. So, it, it the, so the answer is it depends. There's no there's no yay or nay here. I appreciate that. And everybody, that's a wrap of the Liquid Launch Project. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to the show, and make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Launch Project.